The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of, Ju- governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and, the, and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. John went throughout the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding roads shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, we began last week, uh, Advent last week, and I told you about how little I like and look forward to preaching during Advent because it seems like I've already said everything that there could possibly be said about Advent or Christmas or this whole time of year in general. But there isn't anything new that I can tell you that you don't already know, that you haven't already heard. So I decided that this year I will get down to basics, and instead of trying to be overly creative, I thought that I would instead tell you something that you already know, uh, but maybe haven't thought about in a while. Things so simple, so fundamental about Christmas and Advent that perhaps we haven't, haven't contemplated them in quite some time. And so I'm boiling the entire Advent season into four words. These four words are the same four words that were hanging from the Advent wreath in the church where I grew up, St. Vincent de Paul in Seward, Nebraska, uh, where I attended Mass throughout my entire childhood. And last week, the word uh, was hope, and that is essentially the entire Christian message, uh, the entire message of Christmas, and it's hope. Hope not in politics, hope not in cable news, hope not in even your family or your friends, or even hope in yourself, but hope only in God. We ought to only hope in Him. It is vain to to place our hope in anything else but Him because everything else will end up disappointing us. And with all that in mind, I gave you homework uh, last weekend to view the world around you from the perspective of hope in God. Now, I don't know how that went for you, but uh, I did the homework too, of course, and uh, for me, when I filtered all of the events in my life all of the individual personal react uh, interactions with other people, all of the all of the happenings in the world of the last week, both good and bad. When I looked at all of that with hope in God, my anxiety seemed to lessen. Don't get me wrong; the worries didn't go away; they were still there. Uh, but the, God isn't magic; He just can't make everything nice all of a sudden. But what happened is that the worries and cares of the world, instead of being in the forefront, right in my face, for a moment they slipped kind of into the background and Jesus came to the forefront. And when I viewed the world around me in hope, when I, what I saw was him and not the world. And I think that's a place that I can go back to, a place of hope where my concerns and they take a couple of steps back and and Jesus comes clearer into focus. I don't know how many of you actually did the homework that I gave you. I hope some of you did. And I have no idea if you got anything out of praying uh, with hope for this past week, but I can tell you that it helped me. And if you didn't get anything out of it, or if you forgot to do the homework, maybe give it another shot this week. There's no harm in trying. Uh, It's important, though, that we try because we can't go into the Christmas season unprepared. All right, now that I have last week out of the way, we can move on to this week. The second of the words that hung from my childhood Advent wreath was Peace. And thank you to the parishioner that made these banners. 
they're going to come in handy. Peace. Well, there's no peace in this world right now, Father. How could we possibly even, you know, uh, now we're just talking in platitudes, hope and peace, uh, all some kind of hippie stuff. Now, I'll admit that usually when I hear the word peace, hippies do come to mind, some sort of utopian idea that in, in reality it's not actually possible or it's unattainable, but the reason that we have such an adverse reaction to the word peace is because we don't understand what peace actually means, because contrary to popular belief, peace does not mean that there is a lack of conflict. That's not peace. Peace doesn't mean that we all get along and everything is perfect. That's not peace. Peace doesn't mean that there isn't a care in the world, because that, that's a fake promise. It's not a possibility. Those things will never happen because the world isn't perfect. I actually, I actually wrote a paper about peace in the seminary. Uh, I kid you not, the title of the paper was Justice and Charity in War, a Christian Evaluation of the March 2003 Coalition, Coalition Invasion of Iraq. Yes, those are the type of things you write about in the seminary. And yes, I wrote a paper about war that was actually about peace. Uh, it was in a virtues class, and uh, the, the virtue that I was writing about was charity, love. Because peace in the traditional sense doesn't mean some type of utopian tranquility. The great writer and theologian, St. Augustine, he wrote that, that peace is not the, the absence of conflict, but rather it is the state that a person or thing achieves when it is in accordance with the larger created world. In other words, peace is recognizing your place in creation. Peace is about recognizing who you are and who God is. So let's take a look at today's readings, because they're all about peace, whether it says it or not. We have in our gospel the, the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry, and St. Luke outlines some historical facts about this period in time. It is what he says. It was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. Herod was the Tetrarch of Galilee. And he goes on and on, and he lists all of these people that were pointing to a very specific uh, point in time. Uh, and he does the same thing at the beginning of the, the gospel where he's speaking about the birth of Jesus. He lists dates and government figures of the time to make an accurate record of the events as they occurred. And the interesting thing is that this period of time was known as the Pax Romana, P-A-X Romana. And in English, that means Roman peace. It was a period of about 200 years from the year 27 BC to the year 180 AD. And it was during this 200 years where the Roman Empire had complete control over the entire Western world. And during this period of time, there were no major wars. And because there were no major wars, there was a unified currency. There was a system of roads and trade routes. Every Roman citizen was guaranteed security and safe passage from one place to another. So there was peace. Everything was in right order. And it was during this Roman peace that Jesus was born. It was during this peace that Jesus died and rose from the dead. And it was during this Roman peace where the apostles began to go out to all the nations and preach the gospel. And in less than 30 years after the resurrection of Christ, Christianity had spread across the entire Roman Empire. A remarkable fact. The Christian gospel spread like wildfire because the state of the world during that Roman peace allowed travel and the spread of ideas to occur. There were no, no obstacles, politically or physically, to prevent the gospel from getting to Rome to the edges of the world in no time flat. And that's what it means in the Bible when it says, in the fullness of time, God sent his only son. In other words, it was literally the most perfect time in all of human history for things to happen. But also, keep this in mind, that during this Pax Romana, this Roman peace, it was illegal to be a Christian. Christians were arrested. They were killed for simply saying the name of Jesus, simply for saying the words, I believed. 
Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear about innocent people being arrested and tortured and killed, the first thing that pops in my head is not the word peace. And yet, that's what we're presented with. This was a time of peace. It was necessary for the church. It had to happen. Christianity would not have taken off if it weren't for this period in time. So therefore, it must be possible to be at peace when the world around you is trying to destroy you. Let's go to our first reading from the prophet Baruch. Now, we don't hear from this prophet very often in our weekend readings. Uh, so we have a, an opportunity to learn a little bit about him. And it turns out that you've, if you've been attending Mass the last few weeks here at this church or in Arapaho, it turns out that you probably know a lot about him already without even knowing it, because for whatever reason, this keeps coming up in my homilies, this, the, the period of history called the Babylonian exile. And Baruch lived during this time. He lived in Babylon. A period of about 70 years where God's chosen people had everything taken away from them. Their king, their land, their place of worship. They were forced into servitude a thousand miles away from their home. And that was Baruch's reality. That was his world. And yet, this is what he tells us in our first reading today. Jerusalem, take off your robe of mourning and misery. Put on the splendor of glory from God forever. For God will show all the earth your splendor. You will be named by God forever, the just, the peace of justice, the glory of God's worship. Up Jerusalem, stand upon the heights, look to the east and see your children gathered from the east and the west at the word of the Holy One, rejoicing that they are remembered by God. Once again, like last week with Jeremiah, we have words coming from a man that don't match that man's actual place in the world, that his situation might these are words of victory. These are words of peace and of justice. And they're coming from a man who is enslaved. Interesting. It would seem that peace then has nothing to do with slavery or freedom. Peace has nothing to do with your actual situation in life. Because peace is possible in even the darkest of situations. I was trying to figure out why this whole Babylonian exile thing has been coming up in so many of my homilies recently. Like four out of the last five have talked about this thing. And I can probably count on one hand the number of times in the last five years that I've talked about it before then. But uh, I was having a conversation with a person this week and we were talking about how we're kind of living right now in our own Babylonian exile. We're living in a land that knows nothing of our values. A land that knows nothing of our God. Uh, and that land, that promised land that we once knew, is something that our children have never experienced and might never experience. One of my friends sent me a text this week, and it was a screenshot of something that someone had posted to Twitter regarding the, the Supreme Court case about abortion that's happening right now in the news. And the Twitter post was posted by the Women's National Law Center, and it said this, Rise and shine. Today's the day. It's time to show that abortion is love. Abortion is justice. Abortion is essential. And it struck me how hurting, how broken, how lied to and seduced, how misled and deceived that you would have to be to say something like abortion is love. Think of what those words mean. The aborting of a human life is love. Those are the words of someone who doesn't know what love is. Those are the words of someone who doesn't know peace. And I know that they don't know peace because they don't know God. They've made themselves God, or they've made their body, their will God. And someday there will probably be a time in the not so distant future where me speaking about something like this in a public setting will result in me getting fined or arrested or worse. And you know what? I'm at peace with that because I know my place in this universe. And I know my place in God's plan. Which brings me to our second reading from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. There is just this one line that I want to talk about. It has nothing to do with peace, but it made me think of something, so I'm going to read it to you. St. Paul says this, I am confident of this, that the one who began the good work in you will continue to complete it. And that's kind of a throwaway line, but these words are actually the exact words that the bishop uses in the ordination of a priest. 
uh, before they're actually ordained priests, each of the priests that are the guys that are going to become priests, they make several promises, priestly promises, sort of like marriage vows in a wedding. And the, the, the last of these priestly promises is obedience. And uh, we promise obedience to the bishop. And uh, so you go up to the bishop, and there I am kneeling in front of him, like four inches away from his face. And uh, I have my hands folded like this, and the bishop takes his hands and puts them around your hands. And he looks at you straight in the eye, and he says, do you promise respect and obedience to me and my successors? In other words, this is the point in which the priest basically signs his life away. This is the point in which a priest gives up spouse and family, the point where a priest hands his life over to someone else, to another man who will now have the authority to tell you where to go, when to move, and where to move. The most defining characteristic of the priesthood is that you surrender your life. It's why we wear black. Black symbolizes the death that we undergo to lay down our lives for the people that we serve. So those words, do you promise respect and obedience to me and my successors? I do. And then the bishop says the words of St. Paul that we just heard in our second reading. He says, after I say I do, the bishop says, may God who has begun the good work in you bring it to fulfillment. And the feeling I had in saying I do, the feeling I had when I laid my life down, pure, peace. From that moment, I knew that my life was not my own anymore. In fact, I realized that my life was never mine, that it belonged to God. And that is the most freeing, most liberating, most peaceful feeling on earth, to know that as long as you know your place in this universe, that you belong to God, and as long as you stick close to him, you will never know anything but peace. Of course, life gets crazy and stressful and difficult and heartbreaking, but through the lens of God, peace can still be found in all of those things, in all of the chaos. Which brings us to our homework. Going along with the true understanding of peace, which is, is not a lack of conflict, that peace is the right ordering of yourself with God, of knowing your place in the universe, your homework is to stop waiting around for peace to come to you. Uh, stop waiting around for things to get back to normal because that's not going to happen. Instead, this week, look at all of the things that might be stressing you out. And it might be just that, just normal things in life that, that, that hound us, that, that get us worked up, that get us tired out. But perhaps there's an area or two where you don't feel at peace. And I want to, you to think about those parts of your life and see what your relationship with God is regarding that part of your life. Asking yourself, am I trying to be God in this situation? Am I trying to make, do everything, make everything better myself? Am I ashamed of something or keeping something from God? Am I not bringing a part of my life to prayer that I really ought to be? Peace is recognizing your place in creation. And we have to recognize our place in creation in every aspect of our life, even the parts that nobody else knows about. In other words, trust God with every part of your life. Allow him to take control. Trust in him, because St. Augustine, he was correct when he said these words, our hearts are restless until they rest in God. Our hearts are restless until they rest in God, because Jesus Christ is our only peace.